just a background uh, of why you know I'm sitting here going to interview Peter uh, as some random VC. Um, other than Airtree Ventures, uh, I uh, and Pry Two Funds, as many of you know, and, and nine, nine years at Microsoft, partly where I work with Peter, which I'll mention in a moment. I've also been pretty heavily involved in the health system. Uh, I was chair of the Sydney Children's Hospital uh, Network, which ran Sydney Children's and Westmead for a number of years. Uh, I was on the board of the Garvin, which is the, I guess, second or third largest research organisation in the country, 500 uh, researchers. I was on the advisory board of the Sydney Medical University Sydney Medical School, and my family's funded three chairs in medical research, anything from cancer genomics through to paediatric neurology. So it's kind of a, I have a pretty interest, a pretty heavy interest in, in health, and also as a stat. As a statistician by background, I've just been finding it fascinating trying to work through the data side of what's going on and trying to see where the signal is as opposed to the noise. Quickly jumping to Peter. Uh, Peter Newport, um, a very, very good friend of mine from America. Uh, he's currently on the board of LabCorp, which is deep in COVID-19 testing, which we'll talk about. And also he's on the board of Adaptive Biotech, which is deep in the space of looking at therapeutic solutions uh, for, for COVID-19. Uh, he's also an advisor to a number of, number of uh, medtech VC firms. He's been on a number of medtech uh, boards in the past. He was the founder of drugstore.com. He worked at Microsoft for many, many years as a senior VP in the operating systems group. And his last Microsoft while was running a multi-billion dollar uh, effort in, the, in their health initiatives. And, you know, two last things I'll say on Peter before we get into it. One is that next to probably Bill Gates and maybe Nathan Meervold, Peter was the smartest guy at Microsoft and a very, very clear thinker. So I think hopefully you'll enjoy some time with him. And he's also incredibly polite. When, when I was in meetings with Peter and he was my boss for a short while uh, in one of his roles. And when you said something stupid, his, his response would be always sort of considered. He'd look up and then he'd say, perhaps the right way to think about this is blah, 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 which I always thought was a much nicer way than saying, you idiot, Daniel, what are you thinking about? Um, so before we start quickly, uh, neither of us are clearly experts in any we're not um, virologists, we're not immunologists, we're not clinicians, we're not health economists, um, but we've spent a lot of time, both of us, and uh, collaboratively looking at trying to what's going on and trying to see through the data, as I mentioned, and with Peter's experience at LabCorp and uh, Adaptive. We'll try and stay into the, in the world of what actual data is telling us, not pontificate, and we clearly love a bunch of questions. So I think we'll, what we'll start, maybe, initially is with Peter, maybe starting with a baseline discussion or a baseline sort of uh, scene setting about, you know, what do we know and what do we don't know about COVID-19, disease rates, contagion rates, risk factors, who it impacts, hospitalization, just that viral loads. Can you just give us sort of your sense as you've been spending probably more time than any of us in this space right now? Well, thanks, Daniel. Daniel, and welcome everybody. Um, first, I have to correct a couple of things. Uh, Daniel really set me up poorly for this. Um, I'm certainly not the smartest guy in the room at Microsoft ever. Um, I would say that one of my board meetings today, um, dealing with companies at your phase of existence was, how do we get our loan from the US government? Um, so we, um, Navigating Cancer, where I'm on the board, which is a workflow tool for cancer community clinics, um, is looking to be able to keep all of their people on board um, and having to document all the things that James was talking about. So that was part of my day, which came immediately after spending two hours with the scientists at LabCorp um, about what exactly what Daniel asked. The, the bad news is we know, we don't know very much about the disease progression and the disease prevalence in the population. We know a lot about the genomics of the disease. We know a lot about how it is infiltrating and connecting in the body, but we don't know enough to understand what the right social policy uh, choices are. Because of the severity in certain parts of the population, we've chosen to to do everything we can to avoid things like are happening in Italy and. Daniel's favorite part of Italy, Lombardy. Um, the U.S. was slow to start on testing. Well, there's a lot of reasons why that was true. Um, partly the way we're organized, partly there's a great article in today's Wall Street Journal about how WHO actually 
hid some information coming out of China, which slowed down a number of people's responses. It's a really sort of tragic situation if uh, the reporting is to, believe, to be true. Um, we have scaled testing dramatically. So we, part of the way it works in the United States is the CDC controls, once it's des uh, designated a public health emergency, no commercial lab can test. Only the public health authorities can test. It wasn't until the end of February when the CDC determined that their test didn't work when they did a trial run. So from the end of February to March 5th, we developed our own test. And from March 5th to today, we've ramped from zero to over 40,000 a day. This is a PCR test. This determines who really has the disease. Um, we've done over about half a million tests during that time. Uh, the testing positive rate because of the screening protocols in order to get the test is roughly in the mid single, mid double digits, you know, like 15 to 18%. Um, that tells us that we are doing a good job screening. It tells us um, who has the disease. It doesn't tell us at all about the asymptomatic population. Um, the thing that you're really worried about is why does the disease transmit as quickly as it does and what are the things that you can do to do that and there's been a lot of debate about the human human uh, transmission in the beginning that was one area where China wasn't clear of what they were seeing early on which slowed the world down and then it's what's particular insidious in this disease is you are a transmitter seven days before you have any symptoms. So during this period where you just think you're a normal person, you are actively infecting other people. Um, and that is why the transmission rate is measured in these models somewhere between two and a half to four and a half. Measles is on the order of 30. So it's not like measles or smallpox. The case fatality rate, which really needs to know how many people have been infected. And if you don't know who the asymptomatic people are, you can't really know how many people have been infected. So they talk about the case fatality rate, AKA deaths, based on the number of people who have tested positive. And Daniel's probably much closer to the, what the numbers are, but it varies dramatically from place to place. Um, we're currently, New York is currently experiencing something in the high single digits. Uh, where I am in Seattle, where my home is in Seattle, I'm not there right now, is in the low single digits. The models typically model between one to 3% leading to the estimates of the, the, the so social cost, if you will, the human cost, the health cost. Um, to be pretty dramatic if in fact you get 50% of your population uh, infected. So that's kind of a rough overview. Um, the thing that is confusing, uh, and, and if you look at press reports, and you probably see different press reports than I do, is who's in charge of trying to figure out what data we need in order to make the decisions we need to make as a society in terms of the trades between economic activity, normal activity, risk to humans, and risk to the economy. And, and those are, um, if, if we, and, and different countries have different public health um, spending, public health infrastructure, public health, but it's really getting at some of those questions uh, that I think is the next wave of, of this. And that's where you need a different class of testing, which nobody anywhere in the world has really scaled up. Peter, just one question. You know, we talked this the other day on our call, but you know, the, the, the risk factors, and this is bounced around a lot in terms of what people talk about as risk factors um, for, for this disease. And clearly being old is not a great thing. Um, outside of being old and people with, some systemic, systemic lung disease or lung function issue. Um, you know, a number of people have talked about, uh, initially there was people who are immunosuppressed, that was a risk factor, that seems not to be the case now. Um, there's a, there's a, 
interesting set of data talking about obesity being a risk factor. Um, and so, so I'd love your sort of thoughts on, you know, when you look at the current data, the latest data, and this is changing daily, what are you, what are you seeing as the risk factors for the disease outside old people and people with lung conditions? Well, um, so the lab core scientists have uh, accumulated 200 different uh, published reports on this. Most of them are out of China because there's where you had cohorts that were, you're able to study the outcomes. Um, there's a few from Italy. Um, the data is really conflicting. So the answer is we really don't know very much. Um, the, the, it's called SARS because SARS is severe acute respiratory symptoms. That's what um, the progression of the disease leads to, which is why you worry a lot about vents. It gets in your lungs. The, the thing that you see if you are a radiologist and you see some of the things is you just get basically opacity in your lungs, which means they don't function properly. Um, but the things that lead up to that are super unclear. And that's one of the things that Adaptive is actually working on in trying to better understand what the immune system response is and be predictive by being able to characterize the immune system response about who's gonna to progress to a bad outcome versus who's gonna to progress to a mild outcome versus why do people get asymptomatic or why do people who are infected remain asymptomatic and never know they have it. Remember over 88% of the people who have and measure positive in the test basically progress just to have a normal flu outcome. You're really talking about 5% that progress to um, a severe disease and then the, whatever the fatality rate is in the particular environment is the other three to 5%. The, the, the newest information actually coming out of the US is the black community is having very different outcomes uh, in Louisiana and parts of New York by a factor of six versus um, what has been found in other countries. And we really have no, there were people that were speculating what the hypothesis is. Of, is it obesity? Is it some um, hypertension? Is it some other thing? And, and there is no agreement among the medical professionals that were on the call. I want to come back to testing in a second, but, but uh, and sort of the you know, the time lapse of testing. That's one of the real issues is the the lag in getting data back, and then how do you hold people back for eight eight hours or four hours or two hours um, around that? So I'll come back to testing. But one of the things about um, when we're looking at uh, post disease, because some of the other research has changed a lot over the last few weeks, has been um, potential collateral damage post recovery. And the initial stuff I'd read was, you know, it's nothing. It's kind of like you get through it, you're okay. And, and then the more recent stuff I've been reading is talking about from the scientific journals, they said, even for people who don't have severe, i.e. get into ICU, not, not just those people, but people who get quite sick could have not only um, long-term lung issues, but cardiac issues um, as well. Um, so so love your sort of, again, what you, the latest you've read, seen about disease. Yeah, so they, I mean, this is, remember, this is called a novel cor coronavirus, right? So novel means it's never been seen. Uh, we know that it progresses differently than SARS-V1 did um, in a variety of different dimensions. It's closest genet genetically to SARS-V1. And so the only people that can be speculating is how have we tracked the long-term impact that got SARS-V1 sick? And I'm, I don't claim to be an expert on that. I, I've got a slide here where I could look at it, but there are some long-term respiratory issues from that population. That population was relatively small. Um, and anytime you look at these things, you've got to look at the confounding factors. So I don't know that there's been enough science to really understand that. To think that you're going to get away scot-free, unlikely, you know, severe respiratory diseases, your lungs aren't which is why they do lung transplants. They don't generally regenerate super well, right? So it's not surprising that you might have long-term uh, respiratory issues. Um, two things, one about testing and then talk about uh, reinfection rates. I think that's the other thing that everyone's very interested in. Uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
again, the, the scientists would say what we know so far is that, um, and remember, I'm not a scientist, so I'm, I'm just really good at pattern matching and remembering things, um, is that for, from the studies that have been done as people are trying to build these serological tests is you build neutralizing antibodies. So it's unlikely, it's highly unlikely that in a short period of time that you're gonna get reinfected. What we don't know is because we haven't had enough time with enough quality of the serological testing to know what the length of that immunity is gonna be. So in the next phase, going from PCR testing, which is actually measuring is the RNA, is the DNA of the virus present in your body, to serological testing, which is to measure um, have your B cells expanded to where you have uh, created antibodies to attack the disease. And then those B cells stick around and how long they stick around and what level, you know, how, how long do you have a viral enough capability to resist the disease? The, the people that we've looked at and they did do a study in macaque monkeys, um, which says, at least for weeks, you have a good immunity. So it seems hard to believe that there's, a, you know, except for a very small part of the bell curve, that reinfection is a short-term worry. Uh, can we just talk a bit about testing and about, you know, how how realistic is it that we'll get to a a a test that can be distributed quite widely through the population on mass with a very quick turnaround of test results? In the PCI context. Yeah, you, you're, you're asking a lot of conflicting things there, right? So um, the only way we get to, and so now, and now you have to say which of the tests, right? And so the only definitive test, it's going to be a while to have um, uh, a simple test that gives you like a pregnancy test and immediate response. We don't think those are going to be sensitive enough or, or, or specific, specific enough. Um, the PCR test, the way we were able to scale up is through robotics in the lab. So if you really want to have a point of care test, you're going to have a more expensive, perhaps faster turnaround um, time, but not scale, unless you have the type of equipment, which can be both specific and work, highly distributed. We you know, there's some tests that have been published that people, just like the CDC test, it worked. If you were super well qualified, it was slow. It didn't work in any of the state-based hospital labs. The manufacturers that have released tests, they, some, some still haven't been made to work, even though they've been released. Um, there's a million reports out there. The NHS purchased 17 and a half million serological tests. They didn't work. Spain bought a whole bunch. They didn't work. So people are rushing tests, but they don't understand the work required to operationalize it, the skill, the infrastructure, et cetera. So you asked for, you want quick and scale. You're gonna get scale before you get quick. And scale will be able to do, we, we have, I can't talk all about it, but we expect to be able to have a swab at home, which we can run on the existing equipment so you remove the need for PPE, you remove the need to go to a specialized spot, a bunch of things. So making it easy to get the test, sending it to a lab and getting a response, that will happen relatively quickly. Getting a point of care test that you can scale, I don't know, that's a much harder problem and, and I, don't, I, I don't wanna make a forecast when that would happen. That's for a PCR test. So logical test, you got to figure out first. I mean, the first thing that's going to happen is people are going to take somebody who's had the disease, cleared the disease, they're going to donate their blood, and they're going to be able to spin the serum out of it and inject it into somebody else. We'll probably see, I don't know, probably today people are already doing that in the hospital setting. That'll be the best way to either treat a patient or to protect a healthcare worker. Um, someone's mentioned on the on the thread about reagents, and the, uh, I don't think either of us ex experts in that. Yes, 
these tests require a lot of reagents. A lot of the reagents are made in China and there's going to be a short supply of reagents, but I'm not quite sure um, what else we could add to that unless you've got a comment on reagents, Peter. We didn't talk about it today. Yeah. The, um, I, I, I want to come back and talk about the economy and about, you know, when do you open up um, and, and really step that back to, uh, you know, the, the two, the, the two, the, the sort of, not two, the number of discussions going on are, you know, one, get it to zero. So you've, you've stamped it out. Um, and then off you go back, back to the races, which seems not realistic. And the other one seems to be this, you know, boundary condition of um, releasing enough of it into the population to develop herd immunity. So your R0, your R0 comes down over time while you're not blowing out your ICU capacity for the people who are sick. Um, let's start with the vaccine. What's your latest understanding on the vaccine story? These are easy questions. <laughs> well, you sort of shifted gears on me. So let me go to the question first. Yeah. It's probably the easiest answer. Uh, the, the world is moving faster than it's... Uh, the other part of LabCorp is we do do work with drug development companies. We are... There's 260 active trials going on right now. Um, there are two in humans already. There's another one that is gonna be in humans in the next four weeks, et cetera, et cetera. That said, acceleration of the process that normally it takes three years is not gonna happen in six months. Remember a vaccine you're gonna to give to well people. So to prove that it's safe, and you're gonna give it to a broad, Thing of well people, which means you have to have a large enough cohort that you see the edge conditions of how different immune systems, different genetic makeup, different races react. So you're going to need a fairly scale trial. You're going to have to give it multiple weeks to months to be able to make sure that it has the right safety profile. And your first in human trials are really going to be in the summer. So anybody that thinks you're going to scale up manufacturing and have billions of doses of a vaccine before the end of next year is on drugs, in my opinion. And that's even assuming that Gates, you know, spends billions of dollars building up manufacturing capability for the seven best vaccines that make it through the initial phases. So that's the vaccines. I think it'll be much earlier to get a therapeutic. And the therapeutic is what's going to allow us to open up sooner because therapeutics, you only give to sick people. So you prove that they're safe, and then depending upon how sick you are, you can take more um, risk because your only outcome is a bad outcome. So the risk of the drug side effect being worse than the known death is where we can test much more quickly in humans. And the therapeutics fall into the antivirals and the antibodies. There's, I don't know, there's three trials going on with antivirals right now, which have already been proven in another instance, whether it's the Ebola vaccine or the Hep C vaccine, uh, not vaccine, uh, antiviral cocktail that um, Gilead has. Those trials are ongoing. They're underscaled at the moment, but they will scale up quickly. <clears throat> the antibodies, um, there are um, uh, Moderna and Regeneron are both working on antibodies. Adaptive signed a deal with uh, uh, Amgen to work on an antibody. They'll probably, antibodies are very well known, very well understood, very easy to manufacture, relatively safe, so on and so forth. And so I think you'll first see antivirals, antibody solutions, which now takes some of the burden off the healthcare system, right? If assuming they work. Now back to your pre precedent question, which is how do we know when to open up and what is the right way to do that until you really know what the penetrance is of the disease in the population and you have some way to monitor and change behavior. Right now we've had population, what I would call population-based behavior is just lock everybody down. <laughs> And that way we can slow the R naught, whatever that number is, we can at least cut it down. You're never going to get it below, you're never going to get it to zero. The question is, can you get it below one and to sustain it below one? Um, 
And I think that's unlikely that we can handle being locked down long enough for the R1 to be, R0 to be below one so that the virus dies out. So therefore, I think the most likely outcome is that we have the disease, having some level of transmission in our society as we go about doing our business. And then the question is, how do you keep it from accelerating back R0 up to three or four? And what measures do we take along the way to do that? Will masks, everybody wearing masks do that? Will, um, if we have no group activities, but you allow people to go to work, what do you do in the work environment? What do you do if you want to have a restaurant open? Do you, you make it half as many tables, um, just like they're doing in the grocery stores where you have to be six feet apart? What does that do? But there'll be some balance and some mix. And I suspect given that we have 50 states that want to do things differently in our country and a lot of countries around the world, people will monitor which mix of activities of going from these broad population to case-based measures, whereas once you're identified as having the disease and you're in an infectious state, you get isolated for the period of your transmission, transmissibility. You probably get isolated from your family because it's dumb to go home and isolate at home so that you infect the rest of your family and so on and so forth, which is how Korea and China have dealt with it. The, um, you're, you're already seeing some European countries, you know, including Spain, which is still running at, you know, an enormous death rate compared to normal flu. They're, they're already talking about, and they've done more severe lockdowns, like you can't go for a run kind of thing. So already releasing. So it would seem that in the not too distant future, economy is going to have to open up uh, in a way and then have your effective SWAT teams descending on, on pockets of, of outbreak. Um, the, the, you know, obviously, um, the US was later in getting testing going, um, is now accelerating that. Its, its death rates are still high, and they're talking about this week, I think, being the worst week for death, what have you. But how, I mean, how do you see the US moving? You say it's 50 states. Will the federal government be putting a lot, can they put a lot of controls across the nation, or you will have you know, New York locked down a lot longer because it's had such a severe outbreak in New York, New Jersey, where and Washington State was worse. But how do you see it playing out? Yeah, it's a, the, the travel thing is a really interesting question uh, as, as you start to open up. It, it's clear that most countries, including the US, can't print enough money or borrow enough money to run their their economies on lockdown for 12 months. Just, I just don't see any, any feasible way for that to happen without a total collapse of anybody's belief in money and, and exchange. So yeah, I think people will start to open up. And then the question is, what are the things to try to keep the, the, the transmission rate low? I, I, I don't, there's no magic bullet. The, I can't find a magic bullet. There's a question here. There's two, there's two good questions here. One, somebody that knows a lot more about it than, than I do about what the antibodies are going to do and what it really tells you. And the scientists talked all about it. We have a whole white paper that said you can, you can just test for the antibodies, but you have to know a lot more about their characterization. There's four different ones that come, which ones and what level and the yada, yada, yada. There's, there's a lot to be learned about the antibodies in order to know whether they're still, um, A, have the immunity and whether they're still transmitting, transmitting the disease. I agree with that. And that's what the science has to figure out. That will happen in the next 68 weeks, in my humble opinion. And then we'll have to make some choices based on, on that, uh, both not only in each, uh, in our country, but in each of the countries about how they want to deal with people who um, have, don't have, <laughs> The second question was, do we think that there'll be, uh, I'll call it the, the immunity passport. Um, Germany's talking about creating one. Um, a couple of the other European countries are, and that is some authenticated thing that says, yes, you have the antibodies and you're not infected. You're not likely to infect other people. 
um, based on my belief of the likely scenario that we're going to have to live with this disease in our presence for a period of time until we have a vaccine, I think that's very likely outcome. Now, people don't want to talk about it, but I still think it's a very likely outcome and probably will improve our economy's ability to operate. And the second order part of that question is, as unstated though, is what civil liberties are we willing to give up in order to be able to be effective at case-based measures? In other words, contact tracing, uh, tracking people who are infected to make sure that they stay in quarantine and, and those kinds of things. There was one question. It also seemed likely to me. <laughs> there was one question about flu deaths and, you know, I think it's really important to try and unpack this because there's been a lot of um, misrepresenting about death rates. So I think I can share my little spreadsheet with people, but if I can tell you through some numbers for, for people, Peter seen this ad nauseum, but um, if you look at the USA normally, the USA will have um, somewhere between tw you know, 20 and 50,000 people a year will die of the flu. Um, currently, currently in the US, they're sitting, um, and so it's about 149 deaths per million, roughly, if you take the fifth to higher number. Currently, the US is sitting at 45 deaths per million. So it's sitting at currently the 30% of the overall annual uh, flu death rate. Now, this, this is happening in like two weeks, right? So you've got a time lapse here. You know, what could it look like? Well, the best example probably is Lombardy. I mean, everyone talks about Italy, but you break out the region. That's not the, that's not the best example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, best in terms of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Best but worst. Okay, fair enough. Um, if you look at Lombardy, you see that um, generally speaking, Lombardy, uh, region of Italy and Italy as a whole will have about 82 deaths per million annually from the flu. Um, and so in Lombardy, it's about 120 deaths. Already in Lombardy, they're running at 970 deaths per million. So nearly 12 times the flu rate, the flu death rate. Um, and, you know, Italy's, Italy as a whole is running at three and a half times the annual death rate. Uh, New York State's running at 2.3 times the annual death rate. Spain's at 3.1. France is already at over one. Um, so there are countries where the, the sort of comparison, the flu, when you take it down, you see that even countries which are doing lockdown will end up with more people dying of this over a probably two or three month period by orders of magnitude than die of the flu annually. Now, if you look at Australia's numbers, you know, Australia, we, again, you know, this variable clearly, but we lose around 2,500 people a year to the flu with a 97 flu deaths per million, roughly. Uh, currently, uh, we are running at two deaths per million. So we're currently running at, uh, deaths are 2% of the normal annual flu rate. Now, what does it mean? If you extrapolate out just quickly, if you look at that, if, if Australia suddenly was on the Lombardy curve, um, we'd be sitting today at around 25,000 deaths rather than 52 deaths. Now, you can have a view as whether 25 is a good number or a bad number relative to the costs of, of, uh, of non-action. But I think when you do unpack the flu versus other non, uh, versus COVID, you need to understand the, the death rates in a regional basis. And you also understand this is happening over a two or three month period. And, um, you know, we, we're still not seeing what, what, the, what, the, what, the, what the final rate will be. But clearly in US, Italy, Spain, France, uh, UK, uh, Norway, they will, sorry, not Norway, yeah, uh, sorry, Sweden, they will head up, they will, they will probably go well beyond the annual flu death rate with COVID. And so already uh, two, three, four, five, ten 10 times that. I think on the interesting questions, uh, which made people looking at, we were looking, Peter and I were just talking earlier about, you know, Germany, um, which is an interesting data, data set. So Germany is obviously in the middle of Europe, has a similar uh, death rate per uh, million to most countries in, in the flu seasons, in the annual flu. Um, it's running a very low death rate. It's running at 26. So it's running at 26 per million versus France, just across the border, 167, Spain, 316, Italy, 300. Um, and trying to understand, well, what's going on there? And I think one of the, no one knows, but Peter, you, you might go to the thesis and I can probably give the numbers. Sure. I mean, 
It's such an outlier that I asked some of the scientists uh, today, what the, or the medical professionals today, what they thought the reason was. And you know, Germany was early on in testing, but more importantly, the hypothesis is that they were early on at letting people into the hospital, um, whereas other people were trying to keep people out of the hospital to save um, ICU beds and stuff like that. And that the ability to arrest the progression of the disease before it got to be so far that you ended up in the ICU probably led to a, the lower death rate. That certainly the disease is interacting with Germans in the same way. And so somehow they're able to um, mitigate the, the, the progression of the disease earlier on. And earlier on mitigations work way better than waiting until you you, you've got the pneumonia or the stuff in your lungs in a really severe case. So that's the hypothesis, more data to be, to be uh, looked at. I'm um, just a supporting data point for a for hypothesis that's not tested yet is, if you look at the number of hospital beds per 100,000 people, sorry, hospital beds per thousand people, um, you find that Germany is, is, there's really Germany at eight and then the only two, well, Russia seems to say eight, but apparently that's, that's a fraudulent number. The other two that are above eight is really South Korea and Japan. We know the Japanese story is a whole bunch of old people. But Germany does have a much higher proportion, nearly 2x Australia's number of hospital beds per thousand and uh, 3x, uh, 3x the US's and Canada and UK. When you look at ICU beds, it's, it's flipped um, in the sense that the U.S. has by far the higher proportion of ICU beds per per um, per hundred thousand, where it sits at like thirty-four, only outdone by Turkey. And Germany's a bit below that at, at thirty, and then you fall away. So there may well be something in the fact that you've got more hospital beds in Germany to get people processing in well ahead of the disease progression. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other good questions here, Daniel. I might yep. pick up. Um, yep. The question is, is squashing the, the um, curve better or flattening the curve better than squashing the curve and aren't we just prolonging? And the answer is you're pro we are prolonging the infection, the, the prevalence of the disease over time. Um, the benefit of doing that is you reduce the burden, the peak burden on the healthcare system. The healthcare system's a fixed infrastructure. The peak burden is what makes life really really bad if you can get it down to a level where the health system can deal with it and you have these therapeutic interventions then we can deal with it like we deal with every other disease um, and so that that is the strategy the problem is when it comes on so fast you don't have time to to do that and that's why people are taking these extraordinary measures uh, another one was when do i think you'll be able to fly san francisco to australia or vice versa. I think that's going to be a very long time unless we have, unless you have the immunity passport or unless there is some definitive way to say that you, you're not, you're not, if, if adaptive is able to do its TCR based test where we can measure the TCR response way earlier than any of these uh, serological tests uh, or PCR tests, then maybe you might be able to do it, but that's, that's going to be months away. And just on that immunity passport, surely that's also subject to constant retesting to see if the immunity is still valid. Um, yeah. To a certain yeah. Extent. And then the question is, who pays for all that? Yeah. The, it's not going to be a cheap test. We're not in the beginning. It's not going to be a cheap test. Let's put it that way. Do, do you um, try to sort of look, look beyond um, the other side? Obviously, travel is severely impacted negatively for a long period of time. And... Yep and as a subject, tourism. It seems one of the things we've noticed in Australia is this is, the two sectors that have massively changed overnight is one, the government's approach to telehealth and really what would have taken 10 or 15 years of legislative stuffing around has really moved very fast to moving to telehealth and, uh, and better use of the digital infrastructure for health delivery and also just a shift to digital, uh, anyone in the digital space. Um, and we expect those two things to probably continue on, although I might step back a bit, but move on. What's your sort of general feeling about parts of the economy and, and how which different industries may come out of this better than others? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And, and I've been spending some time trying to at least 
create what are sustainable changes in consumer behavior versus what are temporary changes in consumer behavior. And I, I don't know that I have a, a super uh, insight in that area. I think sporting events, concerts, all these things where you get mass gatherings of people, I think are gonna have a very long road ahead. Are you gonna to go to Disney World? I got grandkids, Love, we, were, we take them to Disney World all the time. Are we going to take the grandkids to Disney World until there's a vaccine? Probably not. Um, so I, I think there's a class of consumer behavior where people will make a trade between enjoyment and risk that is different than what's been true um, for a long time. What's the business impact? Uh, everybody's learned that they can work from home. So do companies decide to keep really expensive real estate and office facilities, or do they start to say, look, there's a way to do it. But I also know that, you know, I've got enough kids in their late twenties, early thirties, which say, man, they'd much rather be in a social environment, being able to go to the water cooler, being able to have a meeting, be able to, you know, even in the open environment, they'd be way more productive. And so I think, I don't think that, human behavior has changed enough to say that we all want to work through our computer. It's just not the same experience. Now, that comes from a guy that's in his 60s, but I think that's likely to be true. The, uh, there's one interesting question on the thrill, well, a bunch of them, but one I'm just picking out was about whether there was, a good, you know, there was earlier in the disease, um, there was discussion that um, it, doesn't, it doesn't thrive in the heat. And so when the summer returns to the Northern Hemisphere, it'll all be fine. Um, and that seems to also be not playing out as, as earlier thought. Well, S Singapore is basically on the equator and their experience is no different than, than ours, than the people in the Northeast. So it's not sure to me that temperature is the magic answer. The, the other issue on sort of whether we're coming into winter here, and there is uh, high concern about the combination of normal flu and COVID as being a pretty bad combination to have. Is, is there anything in that or other than your, your, you know, your lung capacity is reduced if you've got normal flu, so obviously you're getting COVID there. Yeah, so what the flu data here suggests is uh, that the social isolation measures have actually tampered down the flu transmission. So it really depends. Now, if you don't have the social is isolation me measures and the flu takes off, you know, I think you have the issue with your health system uh, burden. Um, but the, what the health system here has seen is that the number of flus has dropped off dramatically in the last 30 days as we've implemented these social, social isolation procedures. Wow. It's late my time, guys. <laughs> so I'll let you go in like eight minutes. <laughs> uh, no problem. Um, but just guess, segue, I'll come back to the main topic in a second, but also it seems true that in countries where they've been on massive lockdown, surprise, surprise, um, you know, deaths through car accidents have dropped dramatically through accidents, workplace accidents. But one of the interesting data, point, data points that I was reading about the other night was that heart attacks are well down. Uh, hospital admissions for heart attacks. Yeah, no, I, I've read that too. I, I, I don't claim to have an explanation for it. Um, I think it's probably, you know, maybe, maybe people aren't going upstairs. As, you know, what are the things that are incidental to a heart attack? Um, yeah. The, um, you know, obviously Sam Harris um, has talked a lot about this and others, but the issue about, hey, this is just sort of nature giving us a trial run. I mean, in a sense, you know, the, the, the Armageddon is a, 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 a virus with a very high R0 um, that also has a very high death rate. And, and we have, I guess, COVID-19 has got a kind of relatively high R0, but a relatively low death rate. Whereas I think SARS had a lower R0 but a higher death rate. Now, if you have an R, you know, R naught of four, pick some random large number, and death rate of you know, 10, 15%, um, is, that the, is that the sort of the, the viral pandemic that this is giving us a trial run for? And I think one of the questions is, well, you know, how do you think health systems need to take what's happened now? And if you can, if you can be ready for that one, the sort of the perfect storm. Yeah, so I think there's uh, a bunch of things to unpack there, Daniel. First of all, um, 
the presentation today started with a slide that Tony Fauci puts up every time, and he's the guy who runs the infectious disease uh, NIH cor portion of our, our National Health Institutes. And, you know, we've lived with uh, these kinds of bacterial and viral things for thousands of years. Um, and it's, it's something that society has learned to deal with in a variety of different ways, often, you know, with 30% of the population getting killed out um, back in the Middle Ages. And so this is a long road and it's gonna be a constant battle between humans and the bugs. Um, so that's sort of stage one. Stage two, you know, I think Bill Gates laid it out well in his uh, 2015 TED talk. Uh, Scott Gottlieb and Mark McClellan have laid it out well, um, more recently uh, applicable to this. You have to think about it in the context of war. In, in the sense of war, we spend, you spend, most developed countries spend money to invest in a set of resources that rarely get used, but often get trained, that have spare capacity, have specialized equipment, have specialized surveillance, have specialized however you want to think about it. And we need that specialized contingent capabilities um, to do the war on bugs, however you want to think about that. We haven't typically invested in that uh, in the past. In a world where the United States spends 18% of its GDP on health, most of the rest of the world spends somewhere between 11 to 8% unless you get to lower middle income countries. We have optimized our system for efficiency, not for resiliency. When you optimize, and if you look at the issue about the reagents, the issues about the mass, the issues about all of that, those are around supply chains that have been optimized for efficiency, not for resiliency and safety stock. I think what this impact will have, this impact and the impact of the trade war with China or the explanations that have come out of our war with China, if you will, on the trade front is supply chains are going to get refactored dramatically over the next five years in a lot of different industries. Uh, and there is going to be a change. If you look, I'm a, I'm a, a business guy. If you look at how inventory has declined as a percent of the balance sheet for most businesses, I think you'll see that change. So overall return on assets will go down because the balance sheet assets are going to have to go up to have the kind of resilient and safety stock that allows you to operate in a world that could get shut down for months at a time. And that will be the choice that business leaders have to make you know, depending upon, and in the government, in the case of the war on bugs, business leaders in the case of refactoring their supply chain. I, I, just, just, that's a really super interesting point. I think, I think we'll, we'll have to let you go in a, in a minute and a half. Uh, the, the, you can see businesses making that decision because they're trying to, you know, re-architect their supply chain to make sure they run. Do you, do you think governments will, will take the sort of the war model and go, okay, we need to spend another three, four percent of GDP on on health infrastructure that won't be that won't necessarily be used but is there in the case of you know defense systems for war. Well you could do lots of things like um, you know we build new hospitals but we tear down the old you don't have to tear down the old ones. They don't have to be at the same operational you could mothball them like we mothball an aircraft carrier or a destroyer. I think there's lots of ways that you could put some capital infrastructure in place. It's really about being smart about, do I invest in a antibody platform? Do I invest in spare vaccine manufacturing capacity? Bill's been on the case that, um, that, that we have the same issue in antibiotic resistance. There's no business model for pharma to build antibiotics, yet we have the same problem with bacterials in the, in, in the hospitals. And so we have to have a war on that bacteria as well as on the viruses. And, and, and yet the amount of money we're spending today in two trillion to support, you know, trying to get through 
an unknown duration is a thousand times more than you have to spend annually to put in a defensive force and a trained force to try to deal with it. The problem is it's a public good and there'll be free riders. Just like the, there's a lot of free, free riders on the US defensive force, how are we gonna get countries to pay their fair share in a public good around global sin, sur surveillance? Uh, finish with a, just an observation and the last question for you, uh, which uh, it's, a, it's a big question, but to, I'll let you have, give me a little answer. The observation, just to answer a, que a question from the group, was what about emerging markets? It's a good piece in The Economist about what happens when COVID-19, you know, India is going to be fascinating to watch. I mean, and they've got some health infrastructure, but good luck with social distancing in India. Um, uh, so that will be a disaster to, to unfold. Um, but then you go into Africa, where, of course, depending on the, on the genomics of, of the disease and, you know, how it applies to the populations of Africa, et cetera. Now, you don't have as much movement, um, but, you, you know, if it gets into, in, into village systems or ecosystems, there's no health care. Um, it could be quite horrific. So the, the last question for you, Peter, and we're running over time. Uh, one we talked about a while ago, and I, I should have put earlier on, the, on this thread is, the, and Bill talked about it, was the issue of data, the data lake. You know, one of the things we're scrambling for now is data. And I know it's a big question I should have done earlier, but can you give a sort of short, a brief enough answer as you can in your tired state of how many to think about the construction of the data lake going forward to let us know more about how to respond in the future? Well, the, the hard part, of, so I spent a couple of hours on that today too with uh, two different environments and uh, we are, we are uh, announcing something tomorrow with LabCorp um, trying to build some of this. So there's, there's two components to it. Unfortunately, you know, it's like a fourth graders soccer game. Everybody's going around the ball. Instead of playing their position, playing the future, playing where things are going, everybody's circling around the ball about what we can measure. Just like, you know, what's the number of new cases? What's the fatality rate, number of beds, yada, yada, yada. That does this, gives us zero insight about what the course of the disease is in, in a body, um, why some people respond one way versus the other. That takes deep, hard work. Um, it takes putting that infrastructure in place. And unfortunately, um, there's a lot of challenges to get that to scale. I think people are rallying around that. Um, there's a lot of initiatives going on uh, in the private and public sector Hopefully, we'll figure out um, a way to get access to the deep data so that we can provide some of those insights and have them be more than cohorts of 100 or 200 so that we can really find those edge cases. Um, I'm optimistic, but it's, it's people are looking for six-week wins, and I think you need to look for a six-month win. Yeah, I think just the Australian context for those on the call in Australia, it's it's you know, we've, we still have a government that is unable to think about allowing us to bring the data sets together, be it Medicare and PBS data sets with uh, medical benefits data sets, you know, Cerner Hospital back ends uh, and pathology lab stuff, which is all in the private sector, the Sonics, and, you know, it, isn't, it shouldn't be that hard in a country with an NHS like, you know, our Medicare system to bring the data sets together to give us a much greater uh, level of uh, into of data sets to do intuition off going forward. Uh, Peter, look, I want to thank you so much. I'll pass to James to close out, but thank you so much for the time. I think when I asked you this on the call last week, hey, do you want to do this AMA? And you went, sure. I don't know whether you're in what you're putting yourself into, but I think um, I really appreciate the time. And I think everyone on the call appreciates the time. I'll hand back to James to close out. Thank, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Peter.